We have the CFO uh, from Duolingo that will join us here shortly. Um, so I wanted to welcome Duolingo uh, and Matt, uh, the CFO, uh, onto the event. How, how are you doing, Matt? Matt, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, thanks for taking some time out of your day to share uh, kind of some of the exciting things that are happening there. Uh, we're big believers in kind of uh, democratizing education uh, and what way is, is better than offering kind of this free, low cost uh, subscription uh, with clear goals and, and importantly, I think, uh, clear outcomes. Um, just to level set real quick for yourself as a uh, chief financial officer, you came uh, to Duolingo, you had 15 years of uh, finance and operations experience, I guess, most recently as a senior member of Goldman Sachs Investment Partners. Um, that's as far as I'll go in your, uh, in your journey. Um, but in general, again, thanks for, for coming on. Uh, if you could just quickly uh, maybe talk about yourself, Luis, the CEO, founder, uh, and then also summarize kind of the product and company. Yeah, no, very happy to. I'll, um, I, you did a great job introducing me. I don't think I need to talk more about uh, myself, but I will talk about you know, Luis and the product, and they go hand in hand. So uh, Luis, our founder and CEO, um, is from Guatemala. Um, and you know, he learned English and he uh, believes it fundamentally changed his life to do so. You know, it led him to Duke University and then to Carnegie Mellon, where he created um, you know, really lasting products. One of them uh, is CAPTCHA and ReCAPTCHA. He was the inventor of those things as well. And so he decided that um, the next challenge he wanted to do was to give education, the best education in the world, um, to as many people as he could. And so he found a Duolingo to do that. And our mission, which is where the product really, uh, the product vision really starts, is to um, make education, the best education in the world, universally available. Uh, that's why we have uh, a product that, uh, as you mentioned, is free. You know, you can learn um, from zero to uh, a very high level of proficiency on Duolingo without paying us anything. You have to consume some ads along the way, but, but that's about it. Um, and so uh, that's the, the raw um, product vision that he has, is to make uh, education university available. You, one thing you'll notice about our mission, though, is it's not language learning. That's, that's not, not in the title. It's uh, education. So we started with language learning because it's uh, something that was near and dear to Luis's heart and a way to impact a ton of people over the, uh, around the world. But um, you know, that's not where we'll stop. That's just the start of it. Got it. And yeah, to expand on that uh, topic, simply talk about the different products that you do offer. Um, yeah, happy to. So right now, you know, the main product is the language learning app, um, which uh, I'm sure some folks are familiar with. So that's where you can learn uh, you know, 40 different languages. We have 101 different courses um, and that product monetizes in a couple ways. So we have ads. Uh, which make up you know about 15% of our revenue. We have IAP in-app purchases, which make up you know one to two percent, um, and then about 70 plus percent from our subscription service called Duolingo Plus. So if you want to um, learn the language with uh, less interruptions, so no advertising and uh, no pacing mechanisms, so we have a, a mechanic called Hearts, which is a lot like Lives in a video game. Um, if you want you know to to not have those things. Uh, you pay us a, a monthly or annual subscription fee, and that's our Duolingo Plus product, which again is about 70% plus of, uh, of our revenue. And then the last um, product that we're monetizing right now is a, a high stakes English proficiency test called the Duolingo English test, which competes with the likes of uh, TOEFL and IELTS. Um, and that uh, helps you prove to colleges and universities around the world that you know English well enough to attend school. Um, Luis, again, took this test. He took the TOEFL, I believe. Uh, he had to travel, I think, across country lines to take it. And so his vision for this product was to make high stakes uh, proficiency testing much easier. So you take it uh, on a laptop, you can usually take it in under an hour, uh, and it costs a quarter of, uh, of what the competitors um, charge. Got it. Yeah. So definitely a, a broader uh, portfolio of, of products. And, and I know there's stuff in the future that uh, you've talked about at Duocon in terms yeah. of uh, things like math and other uh, uh, product offerings that could be uh, similar in terms of how a how you learn uh, on your English or uh, language app. Um, yeah. I, I was asked yesterday uh, on a on a radio show, basically just 
in, in general, what, what separates uh, Duolingo? And uh, one of the things uh, that came to mind was obviously the gamification aspect of it. Um, and another thing that came to mind was, okay, you take uh, sales and marketing is roughly like 20 plus percent. And then you have R&D, which is like 40% of, uh, of spend. And it's really that engineering component, that focus on R&D that I think is somewhat of a, uh, makes you guys different than, than potentially other companies or what people think of you. Talk about engineering. Uh, I think the focus, uh, I think you've ex expressed publicly on your website is 45% of the workforce is engineers. Uh, what should we take away from, from that emphasis on the engineer uh, for an education company? Yeah. Well, so... Um... Yeah, you're, you're right about the numbers. I mean, we've disclosed publicly in the S1 and on the website that, you know, uh, engineering makes up a huge swath of our employee base. And then if you expand that to the product, so engineers, product managers and designers, um, it's approaching 70% of our employees are focused on that. Um, th that's uh, not only does it differentiate us in the marketplace, but it's really behind the ethos of the company. So one of the things that was a central insight to Duolingo um, was that when you're learning on a mobile device, uh, we're competing against um, language learning apps for sure, but really against uh, things that are taking your attention, uh, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, these type of things. Uh, and so the hardest part is actually le about learning on your own is staying motivated. You have to stay engaged. Uh, otherwise, no learning can take place. And so that's part of the gamification route that we went. Um, it's part of why the entire brand is around delight. You know, we're trying to make it a delightful experience that people want to come back to so that they can learn. And in order to do that, we have found that um, marketing is important, don't get us wrong. Um, but the most important thing is making sure that we have a bunch of people, engineers mainly, and product designers and managers who are running experiments to try to figure out how to make it more engaging, more efficacious, uh, and more fun all the time. You know, our engineers run hundreds of A/B tests a quarter uh, to run experiments, like little things like um, uh, changing text sizes and purchase flow uh, items, as as well as uh, changing when you uh, do verb conjugation for certain courses. Right. So we're just running tests all the time to make the product all the more fun and engaging. And so that's why we need so many engineers. Uh, and product designers, and, and we're happy to spend huge amounts of our gross profit uh, and invest in in R and D, uh, so that we can do that. Yeah, you know, it kind of also doubles for us a bit as acquisition costs. Um, and the reason I say that is, if you build a delightful, engaging, fun product, people are going to talk about it. You're going to become part of the zeitgeist, um, and you're going to acquire uh, users that way. And that's the predominant way, way we do acquire users. And so, like I said, we're, we're, um, we said publicly, we're, we're planning on spending a lot of money on R and D, uh, in the future as well. Great. Um, I guess going forward, uh, stepping into kind of math, you, you spoke at DualCon about math. Why do you think uh, math is something, uh, that you believe fits, uh, Duolingo, uh, as a product offering? Um, not to sound like a broken record, but you know, Luis is, is a mathematician, right? So <laughs> he loves math. Uh, I think a lot of the engineers in the company love math. That's not really the reason we're going into it, although you know, it certainly helps. Um, the reason we think that you know, we started with literacy, which is our ABC product, which we launched during the pandemic, uh, in part to help parents who are you know trying to manage um, ch children at home, uh, give them a nice app so that they could feel good about their their kids on the tablet or phone learning something. But literacy, math, things like this um, require repetition, uh, just like language learning. Language learning acquisition requires uh, you to repeat uh, certain things over and over again until they become ingrained and you learn them. Um, and it also, the core of Duolingo's um, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, capabilities is the personalization engine we have. Uh, before I go into math, just to let you know, like when I took my Duolingo lesson, uh, this morning, uh, you know, I'm learning Spanish and I think Duolingo thinks I'm pretty good at nouns and they think I'm pretty not good at verb conjugation. So I get a lot of verb conjugation practice. And if you were, you know, at the same level as I am, but we're a little bit better at conjugation, a little bit less uh, good at nouns, you get a different lesson. And that personalization is something that we think can extend across 
you know, a bunch of categories. So when you look across the world, literacy and math are just natural extensions of things that can be personalized and can be repeated um, so that people can, can come back and learn them quickly and efficiently. So Luis is on record uh, publicly of saying he's really excited about math and wants to launch something uh, this year. So, you know, we'll see. He's hopeful about that. You know, no one, no one knows the future on it, but hopefully. For sure. Yeah. And then uh, going to the English test. Uh, so this was something that was fairly small as a, uh, from a line item in the business, it felt like uh, pre uh, COVID uh, then the adoption uh, became enormous um, over the last several years. I think you went from like 13,000 tests taken just before COVID to 300,000 to, uh, I guess, uh, one of the latest, latest conferences talking about 50% growth in that number uh, this year. Um, just talk about uh, one, who does it compete with? Uh, you talked about it a little bit before, but how does this all ultimately add credibility to the, to the uh, language learning app side of the equation as well? Totally. I think you're, that question is spot on just in, in where you're, where you're going in terms of credibility. You know, the goal for the DET is obviously to, you know, provide people with high stakes uh, testing options. It's to grow it. It's to be, you know, a big business. That, that's obvious. Your point around credibility, you know, Luis tells the story right now that if you ask someone on this call uh, who knows another language, what level they're at, the most likely answers are beginning, intermediate, or fluent. Well, first of all, three uh, gradations is not super finely tuned. And also, like, what does it even mean? Like, if someone tells you they're intermediate in French, does that mean they took two years in high school? Does it mean they studied in college? Did they, you know, live and work in France for a while and they're truly intermediate? And so the, the long-term strategic view of having a testing capability is to ultimately integrate it into the app such that when you tell someone that you know how to speak French, your answer is not intermediate. You're, you know, I'm a Duolingo 95 or I'm a Duolingo 75. And, and there's kind of a lingua franca um, to pun a little bit here uh, on, on what it means to have language proficiency. Um, and so that's how like the ultimate vision of it is to, to bring these things together, which is teaching the language and assessing the language. Um, we think that that would be a very powerful, um, you know, strategic endpoint for this. In the short term, we're not there yet. Um, yeah, I don't think I've not heard anyone really refer to their language proficiency yet by a Duolingo score yet. Um, but in the short term, you know, this test, which I mentioned before, competes with um, companies like the TOEFL or the IELTS uh, that have testing centers where you go and you take a test. Um, and the innovation with the DET was that you could kind of use the front facing camera of most laptops with some artificial intelligence and some software that locks, you know, people out of doing other things on their laptop to, you know, do this test online. You don't need to go to a center uh, and you can charge, you know, less for it. Um, you can make it more convenient for the students. You can access more students who otherwise wouldn't be able to take the test. And so, um, yeah, we're really excited about the DET. We think it's a great product uh, that's you know, just completely aligned with the strategy. Right. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Shifting to, to content, again, there's a lot of talk about here. Uh, you hired uh, Linda Siminski, I guess, from PBS. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll read from a, kind of a, a headline. So she'll be help to spearhead the company's push into original content featuring the app's cast of characters. Her purview includes uh, original animation, writing for the Duolingo stories, fictional tales, and Duolingo ABC. My son plays that uh, every single night, 108 uh, straight. Um, so wow, there's awesome. something there. Yeah, Tim Timothy Shea, your VP of Studios and Content, told Fast Company that you are trying to create Sesame Street for grownups. Uh, he added what you just said before, our competition isn't uh, other language learning apps. It's things like uh, YouTube and Netflix, so it speaks to what you were talking about. Just how do you think about um, content in general, the uh, Sesame Street for grownups? I know that's kind of uh, a playful way of maybe talking about it, but in general, content uh, with your characters, you have uh, a pretty good following on on TikTok and other outlets that yeah. suggest there is this kind of affinity and attraction for the characters and and Duo himself. Everyone loves Duo. They really do. <laughs> he's he's great. He's you know he's a TikTok star. That Duo. Uh, he's been fantastic. You know I think Linda is just one another another example of um, us believing that uh, in order to be 
in order to achieve our aspirations of really providing awesome education globally, we have to be a trusted brand. And to be a trusted brand, uh, you have to do right by your customers, like offering them free products that are you know, just as good as the paid products, for example. That's kind of a very core element of it. But then it's also being fun and engaging and um, delightful. And you know, if you think about Sesame Street, boy, what a trusted brand. Um, and so it, it's more than just being Sesame Street for adults, although I think that's a great turn of phrase. It's, it's how do you kind of continue to delight and engage um, people around the world in your brand so that you continue to be trusted and, and beloved. The fan art on you know, Instagram and, and TikTok for Duo and for now the characters, uh, to your point, shows that there is real trust there. There is real loyalty and affinity. And so Linda is going to help us extend that in a, in a bunch of really exciting ways that I'm personally excited to see, given that I grew up on Sesame Street. So the, the dueling of world characters, just to bring it back to her, is, you know, that's one way to extend the brand. So Duo is associated with language learning and Duo will always be associated with us in all aspects of what we do. But the, the characters are now part of the app. They're part of the stories. And um, it gives us just extensions. Um, they have their own personalities. They have their own fan art. They have their own affinity groups. Like uh, it's just a great way to, um, you know, just to continue to extend the brand and make sure that people trust us and love us. Yeah, got it. Uh, to kind of like further that and a couple more questions here, but uh, basically uh, the part of like the, the present culture, again, I alluded to the TikTok following, which is uh, you're yeah. one of the most followed TikTok accounts. And I think you've, you've expressed that uh, zero marketing dollars or very little marketing dollars went into that. Um, now also, it's also known that uh, you saw a bump uh, in terms of usage or downloads uh, uh, due to uh, Squid Games from Netflix uh, as people wanted to try to learn certain languages. We know more of that is coming in terms of uh, Netflix has stated that and more dub shows. Uh, that's not going away anytime soon. What, what, what's kind of your overall thoughts and, and how do you uh, view that type of uh, trend that's taking place and kind of take advantage of it? Yeah. So. I mean, I think there are a lot of people who love our TikTok around the world. I love our TikTok because it's awesome. And like, to your point, we haven't spent money on it. So as a CFO, I'm excited about that uh, return on investment. Uh, our general counsel also seems to love TikTok since he appears in some of them, um, which, is, which is awesome. But to, be, to bring it back to more brass tacks, you know, Duolingo has always acquired a ton of users organically. You know, in the first... I don't know, seven or eight years of the business's existence, it spent a cumulative amount of less than $15 million on marketing, not per year, but like over the course of those uh, seven or eight years. And again, this just goes back to being a delightful brand. We wanted people to talk about our brand and tell their friends. And that's how we grew. And that's how we continue to grow. We, we, you know, love the fact that we acquire a bunch of users, uh, the vast majority organically. TikTok is another way to do that. Squid Games is another way to do that. Um, you know, that's just how we think about our, our growth. We think about levers that we can pull to put us into the cultural conversation, um, to acquire users, uh, organically. We were on SNL, you know, I think a couple of times, you know, without, you know, with them just deciding that we were the language learning app that they were going to use to make jokes about whatever they were making jokes about. Uh, it, so that's a great um, strength of ours, and it's it's one we want to continue to build on with our brand. Got it. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Duolingo Plus, just speaking a little bit about financials uh, somewhat here, um, yeah. but in, in general, Duolingo Plus, uh, kind of tell us the uptake there. Uh, where do you see that going as a percent of, of users? And again, you've talked about uh, potentially getting uh, dating apps and things like that. But um, And then lastly, how are you, you guys thinking about uh, balancing profits against kind of this opportunity at hand? Uh, sure. And then your balance sheet today. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that's those are a lot of questions. I'll take a deep breath and try to get through all of them really quickly. I know we're almost at time. So, um, in terms of Duolingo Plus, you know, that's like I mentioned, you know, seventy plus percent of our revenue, our main monetization angle. Um, you know, a bunch of folks like uh, investors and and the general public want to know how high we can take our penetration rate of our own users how much of them can become subscribers. So our, our subscriber to MAU ratio is one numerical estimate of that. Um, you know, it's gone about up a point a year 
in the past couple of years. So you know, three to four now, I think the most recent publicly stated number was five and a half percent penetration. Um, dating apps are, you know, in the 15 percent range, I think. People ask us, what do we think that number can get to? And the answer is we don't know. We don't know a number. Um, we weren't the first language learning app. We weren't the first mobile app. And we're not the first app to kind of um, monetize its user base through subscription. So those are good guideposts. Um, we just like the trend. So we're, we're pretty happy about it uh, because it's a trend that's driven by us improving the product and convincing more of our users that um, we're worth them subscribing. So no, no idea how high that penetration rate goes, but just, you know, we like, we like the trend. Um, in terms of um, the, the balance sheet uh, and liquidity and, and liquidity and, and balancing growth and profit, we think we have a huge market, a great runway, and we think we're, um, you know, kind of a category defining product. And so we think there's a ton of growth to be had. So we've never been a, we've never been a company that's, do, uh, that's relied on a ton of external funding to burn through capital to, you know, acquire users. So it's always been run relatively disciplined. If you look at our cash flow for the past couple of years and our profitability, it's very close to break even, you know, cash flow positive. Uh, and so we would continue to be disciplined about it. But if we have the opportunity to to, to grow faster, we're, we're going to continue to push our, our pedal down on the growth. And we went public last year and now have, you know, 500 plus million dollars in the balance sheet to, you know, think about interesting avenues for growth. So, so that would be our priority. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think um, that, that's where we'll stop. Um, look, I appreciate you coming on. We're, we're pretty excited about the Duolingo story. We've, it's, it's hard to find kind of education, growth, profits, and everything uh, it, wrapped up in one. You guys have a, a strong lead in the category, it seems. Um, and yeah, I, again, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing some of the insights around the company and good luck in the future. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Take care. All right, Matt. Yeah, so that was Duolingo. Uh, interesting, obviously, uh, product story, vision, uh, the balancing of, again, profits and free cash flow positive recently. Uh, here's a story that we think, uh, again, in an inflationary environment that some people have uh, uh, expressed these days. I mean, it, there's nothing more deflationary than free. Um, and then talk about a subscription uh, story that's attached to this in the infancy of, of that journey uh, and, and new products coming on the horizon. So more on that.